Okay, can we can we begin? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, yes, please. Okay. Om Magyana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Recording in progress. Chaksurun Militanena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namah Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Payevacha Patita Nam Pavan Ebio Vaishna Vibio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So yesterday we had Yesterday we heard Maharaj Pariksit's questions, so today we'll be hearing some answers. We're going to go into the ninth chapter, right? Of course the ninth chapter is Answers by citing the Lord's version. Let's see. Yeah, Maharaj Parikshit had his questions take in chapter eight. Now we're going to hear the answers. The Lord's answer answers coming from the Lord, his version how to answer the questions. So the first verse of the ninth chapter is an answer to the question which is put back in, uh, back in chapter 8, text number, uh, number 7. So if you go back to chapter 8, text number 7, you'll get that question. Okay, anybody like to go back? You can tell me what, what was the question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. <coughs> yes. Uh, the question is, O oh, learner Dhamana, the transcendental spirit soul is different from material body. Does he acquire the body accidentally or by some cause? Will you kindly explain for this? Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is the question. How did we get this body? Was it an accident or was there some cause behind it? And Prabhupada touches on this in the purport. He begins, Maharaj Pariksha's question as to how a living entity began his material life. Although he is apart from the material body and mind, is perfectly answered. Right? We have a material body and material mind but we are spiritual, we are spiritual beings, we are all souls, which is spiritual. How is it possible the two are together? That has to be explained. And Sukadeva Goswami will explain that. There's a, a wonderful lecture by Srila Prabhupada. When Srila Prabhupada was in Tokyo, it must have been about 1973 or 72 or maybe even 71, can't remember exactly, but anyways, there in the folio, Prabhupada's lecture in Tokyo, and he lectured on this first verse of the ninth chapter. And he explained the position of the living entity, how the living entity is actually not fallen, but 
theoretically he, he's not fallen, but actually he's fallen because he, he's thinking he's the master. So this is a problem in the material world. We've all come into this material world with the desire to lord over the material nature. And we're thinking we're the controller. Actually, we're not fallen, but because of the power of illusion, we would understand ourselves to be fallen. Prabhupada explains, the spirit soul is distinct from the material conception of his life, but he is absorbed in such a material conception because of being influenced by the external energy of the Lord, called Atma Maya. So, we know this is a pro everything due to Maya. Maya meaning forgetfulness of Krishna. So this is a problem. We've forgotten Krishna. Then Prabhupada goes on in the purport, second paragraph, now the next question automatically made will be why the Lord influences the, uh, the living entity to such consciousness and forgetfulness. Why does Krishna allow us to get into this condition that we're so forgetful of him and we have this consciousness of conquering and enjoying and exploiting the material energy? Why does Krishna do it? And so Prabhupada writes, the answer is that the answer is that the Lord clearly wishes that every living entity be in his pure consciousness as a part and parcel of the Lord, and thus be engaged in the loving service of the Lord as he is constitutionally made. But because the living entity is partially independent, he may not be willing to serve the Lord, but may try to become as independent as the Lord is. All right, so we've heard all this many times, I'm sure. The idea is that we're trying to exploit, we're trying to control, we're not recognizing our factual position. Prabhupada continues, uh, the living entities are illusioned by the will of the Lord because they wanted to become like him. Like a person who thinks of becoming a king without possessing the necessary qualification. When the living entity desires to become the Lord himself, he is put into a condition of dreaming that he is a king. Therefore, the first sinful will of the living entity is to become the Lord. And the consequent will of the Lord is that the living entity forget his factual life and thus dream of the land of utopia where he may become one like the Lord. <laughs> so that this is the point that we're all dreaming about this utopia, this perfect paradise where everything will be wonderful and we will be in the center of the existence, we will be enjoying and we will be very happy and very satisfied forever. <laughs> that is the idea, that we can live there forever in the material world, enjoying. So this is the illusion of the material world. Then, in the second text, Sukadeva Goswami is continuing to explain to Maharaj Parikshit, and he brings up the concept, the consciousness of the conditioned soul, how we think in terms of I and mine. This is the, the problem, why we're entangled in the material existence why we're taking so many different bodies in the material world. 
because we're thinking, I am the body and this is mine. This belongs to me. This is my home. This is my country. This is my family. It's all mine. <laughs> so we, we like to be the proprietor. We, sh we have to learn from the Bhagavad Gita, of course. Fifth chapter, ten text 29, the last verse of the fifth chapter. Who is actually the proprietor? There's only one proprietor. He is the Supreme Lord. And we are simply servants. We should have that mood to be the servant. But because of our desire, because we want to enjoy so much this material world, independently of the Lord, we dream so many different ways. We have our dream. Prabhupada explains, the karmi thinks of this world as mine, and the jnani, he thinks, I am everything. So, the karmi, his position is like that, that, that this is mine, it belongs to me for my enjoyment. And then, when we cannot enjoy like that, when we become frustrated trying to amass more and more items of the material world, we eventually give it all up. Then we start to think in terms of knowledge, cultivating speculative knowledge. And we come to the conclusion that I am, I am the center of the universe, or I am the controller of the world. Hmm. So it's, it's so lu ludicrous, but still we think like that. And when Prabhupada was in New York in 26 Second Avenue days, there was a yogi who had his little yoga center not far away, and he used to teach all of his yoga students like that. He would teach them to sit and meditate, and he would tell them, now you are controlling the sun, now you are controlling the moon, like that. And they would all sit like that, I am controlling the sun. I am controlling the moon. And they thought, this is great, this is wonderful. Because, you know, in, we do have that tendency to want to be God. And then the idea of being God is very attractive. And if you meditate that, I am controlling the sun, I am controlling the moon, it's very satisfying to our material mind. But it's very far away from reality and very far away from the truth. So we want to understand these things properly. The third verse continues with more discussion on these two conceptions or misconceptions, I and mine. And Prabhupada explains that uh, in the animal state of life, the misconception of mine is perceivable even in the category of cats and dogs who fight with one another with the same misconception of mine. Right, we see the cat dogs here in, in Mayapur, there's many dogs, wild dogs just roaming around the dam and they're always fighting with each other. You can hear them fighting. <laughs> This is my, this is my land, this is my food, this is my place to sleep. Like that, <laughs> the dog mentality. And then, human beings, of course, we have the same problem. We are also thinking, this is mine. But then, a little, Prabhupada explained, a l higher than that, the, is to think, I am the Lord. We're thinking, I, I am who? I am God, or I am the Supreme. And Prabhupada explains, this is even more dangerous than the misconception of mine. If we think in terms of mine, it's a problem. 
Why is it more dangerous than mine? If we're thinking, I am God, why is that more dangerous than to think this is mine? Anyone like to explain? Yes. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Um, is it because in that in that manner of thinking you will never be able to be submissive, and thus you'd never be able to serve the Lord? Well, yes, that's a good. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. Certainly, if we're thinking I am the supreme, I'm God, this is not very humble, is it? <laughs> we're not going to be submissive or like to hear from anyone. Hmm. It's an interesting uh, point you brought up. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, generally, somebody's thinking they're God. What's going to happen to them? Where are they going to go? What will be their destination? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes. Be the Brahma Jyoti. Mm -hmm. They'll be lucky. <laughs> I don't think they'll make it to the Brahma Jyoti. Oh. Okay. That's more for the a Brahma Jnani, you know, someone who simply understands I am Brahman, then he, he's not challenging the supremacy of the Supreme Lord. And he's not denying the existence of the Supreme Lord. But then, oh, then is, oh, I'm sorry. Is it that it's like a stone boat and he will be going down to the hellish planet? Yes, it's more like that, yes. What possibilities are, they could become a big tree and they could stand as a tree for many, many years. Or even they may even become a mountain. <laughs> You know, their souls also in some mountains. So, because they're thinking like that, that I am the supreme, I am the, I'm the controller, I am center of the universe. So, Krishna facilitates that mentality for them and gives them a suitable body in the material world. They don't actually enter into the, into the spiritual world. Brahma Jyoti, that's for people who, are, who can, they've actually entered into the spiritual world. So they're without sin. They haven't committed anything really sinful. But these people, these uh, people have this conception of, I'm, I'm God, I'm the Supreme. Then this is actually sinful. This is actually a challenge to the Supreme Lord. Think like that. So they don't enter into the spiritual world, but rather what they do achieve is they they may get a you know body which will allow them to maintain that kind of mentality of controlling and being supreme, standing very tall. So sometimes it happens like that, that these different people who are very materialistic and very polluted in their consciousness, they're given bodies like that. They may become a big beast, a powerful elephant. <laughs> may become queen, the queen bee. So they're, they're, they're supreme in their hive. All the other bees are collecting honey for them. And the queen bee just sits there and enjoys all the honey collected by all the other bees. So that's the situation, that's the future of these kind of people who have this consciousness. They enter into the darkest regions of ignorance. 
That is the verdict. In Isha Upanishad, they talk like that, that such people enter into the darkest regions of ignorance. Okay, so... Uh, Prabhupada explains, um, although there are sometimes directions in the Vedic literature to think oneself one with the Lord, that does not mean that one can become identical with the Lord in every respect. Undoubt undoubtedly, there is oneness of the living entity with the Lord in many respects, but ultimately the living entity is subordinate to the Lord and he is constitutionally meant for satisfying the senses of the Lord. The Lord therefore asks the conditioned souls to surrender unto him. And then Prabhupada gives a nice discussion about how from Bhagavad Gita Lord Krishna is telling us to surrender. So it's obvious from the Bhagavad Gita that our position is to be subordinate to Krishna, not that we're, we're meant to be the Supreme. If we were meant to be the Supreme, why is he talking about surrender? Why is he telling us to think of him? Why is he telling us to, to take shelter of his lotus feet? So it's very clear from the Bhagavad Gita that we're subordinate, we're not equal to the Lord. And our position is to be the servant. And then at the end, uh, Prabhupada, uh, further on in the paragraph, he says, a, a poor man without any employment or occupation may undergo so many troubles in life, but if by chance the same man gets a good service under the government, he at once becomes happy. There is no profit in denying the supremacy of the Lord, who is the controller of all energies. But one should be constitutionally situated in one's own glory, namely to be situated in the pure consciousness of being the eternal servitor of the Lord. In his conditional life, the living entity is servant of il illusory maya, and in his liberated state, he is the pure, unqualified servant of the Lord. To become untinged by the modes of material nature is a qualification for entering into the service of the Lord. As long as one is a servant of material concoctions, one cannot be completely free from the disease of I and mine. So this is the idea that this contamination this is very deep in our consciousness in terms of thinking that I'm the proprietor, this belongs to me, and it's all for my enjoyment. And so how to overcome that? And so then Srila Prabhupada continues by speaking about bhakti yoga, the science of bhakti yoga, worshipping the Supreme Lord, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, like that. Then this will help us to get rid of this misconception. Karmis, they like this idea, and the Gyanis, they're fond of thinking, I am the Supreme, or I am one, and it's all one. But the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, if we hear it from the devotee, it's not explaining like that. So it's very important that people have to hear the commentary from the Vaishnava devotees, not from other people. We'll, we'll see, uh, even the Mayavadis nowadays, they're even very fond of taking the Srimad Bhagavatam 
and explaining it in their own impersonal ways. And they're particularly fond of the Chatur Sloki. They will like to take the four original verses of the Bhagavatam and explain it in their own impersonal manner. So you have to be very careful. Prabhupada said in, in the past they would never touch the Srimad Bhagavatam and they would never come to Vrindavan. Vrindavan was only for devotees. There were no Mayavadis or impersonalists in Vrindavan. Everyone was a devotee. But over the years these things have declined. And Shankaracharya himself, of course, never touched the Srimad Bhagavatam. But after Shankaracharya's, now different impersonalists, they come along and they, they, tap, they tamper with it and they present their own ideas. All right, so then at the end of the purport of text number three, Prabhupada explains the perfect process is to accept Lord Vasudeva as the supreme in everything. And the best perfection in culturing knowledge is to surrender unto him, because he is the source of everything. Only in that conception can one get rid of the misconception of I and mine. Both Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam confirm Confirm it. Srila Vyasadeva has specifically contributed to the illusioned living entities, the science of God and the process of Bhakti Yoga in this great literature, Srimad Bhagavatam. And the conditioned souls should fully take advantage of this great science. So Srila Vyasadeva in his maturity has given us the Srimad Bhagavatam, very important for us, of course, the fruit of the Vedas. Now, text number four is the answer to another question. If you look back to chapter eight, text number eight, you'll see another question by Parikshit Maharaj which is being answered in this text number four, all right? Would somebody like to look back? Chapter eight, text number eight, just read out the question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, then with pronounce. The question was, what is the specific difference between the body of the Lord and those of common living entities? Now, thank you, Prabhu. Yes. The specific difference between the body of the Lord and the common living, living entities. Yeah, the Maharaj Parikshit made the point that by meditating on the form of the Lord, we can get liberated. We can go out of the material world and go back to Godhead. But if we meditate on our own body or on the body of any other mundane person with a material body, we won't get that result. So there is a difference, there must be some difference between the body of the Lord and the body of the conditioned souls in the material world. So this is being explained here, text number four. Being very, okay, the personality of Godhead being very much pleased with Lord Brahma because of his non-deceptive penance in bhakti yoga presented his eternal and transcendental form before Brahma. And that is the objective goal for purifying the conditioned soul. So Lord Brahma was able to please Lord Krishna by his penance. Srila Prabhupada explains, Atma Tattva, the science of both God and the living entity. The Supreme Lord and the living entity are known as Atma. The Lord is called Paramatma, 
and the living entity is called Atma. Brahman, or Brahma, or the Jiva. Sometimes we may say Jiva Atma. So both the Paramatma and Jiva Atma are transcendental to the material energy. So Sukadeva Goswami explains this verse with the aim of purifying both the Paramatma and the Jiva Atma. Of pu not purifying both Paramatma and Jiva Atma, but purifying the truth about both the Paramatma and Jiva Atma. Paramatma and Jiva Atma are always pure. But the truth about them, in other words, how we understand them. So Prabhupada continues, the wrong conception of the jivatma is to identify the material body with the pure soul. And the wrong conception of paramatma is to think him on equal level with the living entity. So the wrong conception of the jivatma, we identify with the material body, conditioned life, right? We are all attached to the material body, very normal for people to do like that. We're thinking, I'm the body. And then even on a higher level, the wrong conception of paramatma, and we think the paramatma is equal with the living entity. So in other words, we're thinking, but well, I'm God. If I'm the Paramatma, <laughs> they think only they think there's only one soul, so I'm Paramatma, so I'm God. We're all God. You are that, you are God. This is uh, the the way the Mayavadis would present it like this. Tatwamasi, they say, that thou art. <clears throat> So, both misconceptions can be removed by the power of Bhakti Yoga. This is the wonder, the, the power of Bhakti Yoga, that it can remove the, the poison from our consciousness. That mentality, thinking that this is mine, that I am this, I am controlling. So Prabhupada writes, Srila Sukadeva Goswami therefore says that for purification of both wrong conceptions, the Lord presented his eternal form before Brahma, being fully satisfied by Brahma's non-deceptive vow of discharging bhakti yoga. So the Lord appeared with a specific purpose. He's showing his eternal form before Brahmaji. You remember when we were studying Bhagavad Gita, chapter 11, the universal form, Arjuna was able to see the Lord in his two-arm form. But it's pointed out that only th those who have love of God can actually see Krishna in his two-arm form. It says it's actually easier to see the universal form than it is to see the Lord in his two-arm form. So here also Prabhupada writes, except for bhakti yoga, any method for realizing Atma Tattva will prove deceptive in the long run. Bhakti yoga. But it's the only way, no other way, just like we say, Harinam eva kevalam kaloa nasteva nasteva nasteva, like no other way, no other way, no other way, only by chanting the holy name. So we're saying the same thing about bhakti yoga, not by karma, not by jnana, not by yoga, but simply by bhakti yoga. The unique nature of bhakti yoga, that it can help us to remove all the problems in the spiritual path. We just have to follow the process of bhakti yoga, 
then it will take effect and everything can be overcome. Devotees would write to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I have so many problems. Prabhupada, I have so many problems. Prabhupada said, you just come to me. He said, with one kick of my foot, I can knock over all of these problems. So there is the power of bhakti yoga that it, it helps, it will take away all the obstacles on the spiritual path. If we follow the process correctly, so Srila Prabhupada is describing here more about Lord Brahma and how he had perfected it. For, uh, in the next paragraph, Prabhupada writes, Brahma, Brahma undertook great penance in performing bhakti yoga, and thus he was able to see the transcendental form of the Lord. His transcendental form is 100% spiritual, and one can see him only by spiritual vision after proper discharge of tapasya or penance in pure bhakti yoga. So when we talk about tapasya or penance, we're not talking about the type of penance which Haranyakashipu would do to get material powers or someone like Ravan worship Lord Shiva to get material powers. But Lord Brahma, he did his penance simply for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. Because Lord Brahma has the desire that he wants to create for the pleasure of Krishna. He, he, he has that duty to perform. And his purpose in doing penance was simply for the pleasure of Krishna. And Krishna is very pleased with him. And that's why Krishna revealed the form, revealed his to arm form to Lord Brahma. So how do we know Krishna is pleased with us? <laughs> well, maybe if, you're, if Krishna is really pleased with us, he'll show his form to us, right? Just like Brahma here. Yeah. So we, we still have a long way to go. We want to please Krishna. So Prabhupada explains the answer Therefore, the question by Maharaj Parikshit about the form of the Lord is answered. The form of the Lord is Satchidananda, or eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. But the material form of the living being is neither eternal, nor full of knowledge, nor blissful. That is the distinction between the form of the Lord and that of the conditioned soul. The conditioned soul, however, can regain his form of eternal bliss and knowledge simply by seeing the Lord by means of bhakti yoga. So we want to, we're all of course on the path of bhakti yoga, we're cultivating our, our devotion for Lord Krishna. Our desire is to please Krishna also. It's not that we want to desire to just see the Lord. And Brahma also didn't have that desire. It was just simply the Lord wanted to encourage him. He wanted to please him and inspire him in his mission to create. So the Lord blessed him with that vision. And we see also Prabhupada writes, Brahma was then told by the Lord the gist of Srimad Bhagavatam in four original verses. So further on in this chapter, we will hear the four verses which were instructed by the Lord to Lord Brahma. And these four verses were then passed on to Narada, and then Narada passed to Vyas, and in this way, Srimad Bhagavatam came in Parampara, through the discipline, through the Parampara, the knowledge is passed down. We heard earlier, Lord Brahma telling Narada, I'm giving you the knowledge, now you expand it. And so Srimad Bhagavatam was originally four verses, but it has been ex expanded. Now we have 18,000 verses. 
I have heard that in the higher planets where the demigods reside, Srimad Bhagavatam is many hundreds of thousands of verses. Because the demigods live a very long time. So they have enough time to hear many verses. We have 18,000 verses. Prabhupada used to say, one verse a day, you can finish the Bhagavatam in 60 years. Your whole life can be Srimad Bhagavatam. Just take one verse a day. So like that, this is the, the Prabhupada then speaks about regular reading or hearing Srimad Bhagavatam is also performance of bhakti yoga. So we don't encourage this uh, Bhagavat Sapta. Bhagavat Sapta, of course, hearing Bhagavat for seven days is also something, but it's not enough. You want to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam regularly. Srimad, it, is said, it is said in Srimad Bhagavatam, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, by regularly hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is inauspicious becomes eradicated almost to nil. So this is uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, going ahead, text number five. We're hearing about Lord Brahma's penance. Lord Brahma, the first spiritual master, supreme in the universe, could not trace out the source of his lotus seat. And while thinking of creating the material world, he could not, he could not understand the proper direction for such creative work nor could he find out the process for such creation. Oh, you could imagine how perplexed he must have been that he'd been given this task to do the creation, but he doesn't know how to do it. He could not trace out the source of the universe, and he, could, he was thinking about different direction, could not find out the, proce the process for such creation. Could you imagine you're trying to do something, you don't know the process. So, therefore, Brahma has to take shelter of the Supreme Lord. But nobody is there, he's alone in the universe. He, He's, he's the only person, he's the Swayambhu Brahm, he's the first, bo first person born from the, the, the lotus flower which came from the navel of Garbhodakashai Vishnu. But he cannot see Garbhodakashai Vishnu, he cannot understand where the lotus flowers come from. Even though he went down, he, he could not find out the origin of the lotus flower. So he came back to the lotus flower and he was inspired by hearing the sixteenth and he was hearing the two syllables from the Sparsha alphabet. One syllable was taken from the sixteenth and the other from the twenty-first of the Sparsha alphabet. And joined together, they form the wealth of the renounced order of life. Tapa, right? Tapa, austerity. So Lord Brahma did not know where this sound was coming. He he heard this. He heard that these syllables vibrated, but he did not know who was doing it. He did not know who was speaking to him, but he could understand it must be divine, because he's the only person in the universe. So he was in, he's, a, he's a very intelligent, of course, he's Adikavaye. So he understood that this must be instruction from the Supreme Lord. And he took it to be divine and then he began his meditation. And for 1,000 years he meditated on, the lotus, on top of the lotus flower. So in the purple, Prabhupada talks about penance. He said, this penance is the beauty and wealth 
of the brahmanas and the renounced order of life. Right? Sannyasis are meant to do tapa, austerity. Not only sannyasis, actually, uh, vanaprastas also, they're meant to do tapa also. Those in vanapras life, grihastas, they're not, they're meant to do charity. And the brahmacharis, they're meant to study. But later in life, the vanaprastas and the sannyasis, they're older people, they're meant to do tapasya or some austerities to purify their existence. So Prabhupada glorifies the importance, it's very, very good for people. And we see from the beginning of the creation that it was Lord Brahma who took up this tapasya. Right from the beginning of the creation, people have been doing tapasya. Prabhupada explains, by tapasya only can one get the profit of human life and not by a polluted civilization, not by a polished, oh no, pollu polluted, polished, yeah, polished civilization of animal life. The animal does not know anything except sense gratification in the jurisdiction of eat, drink, be merry and enjoy. But the human being is made to understand, to undergo tapasya for going back to Godhead, back home. This is mentioned, of course, in the fifth canto, Lord Rishabdev, he was instructing his 100 sons. Lord Rishabdev, the incarnation of Godhead, he was going into the forest to take up vanaprastha life. And before he did so, he instructed his 100 sons. He told them, don't try to enjoy like the pigs, because that pleasure of sense gratification, that is there even for the animals which eat stool. You know, people, something, they're so foolish, they don't understand that they're, the pleasure which they're so anxious for, that same pleasure, the same enjoyment is there for the pigs which eat stool and these kind of animals. They're having that kind of sense gratification. Yes, you want sense gratification, but we should want the higher sense gratification. Sense gratification on the transcendental platform, not bodily platform. Srila Prabhupada explains, when Lord Brahma was perplexed about how to construct the material manifestation in the universe and went down within the water to find out the means and the source of his lotus seat, he heard the word tapa vibrated twice. And then, just jumping a little bit, uh, so Brahma was thus initiated. Right? Oh, maybe I'll read the whole thing. Taking the path of tapa is the second birth of the desiring disciple. You know, we always get people, I want second initiation. I want second initiation. So here we have Lord Brahma. He got his second initiation from Lord Krishna. Right? The second birth of the desiring disciple. The word Upanayana, the word Upashrenot is very significant. It is similar to Upanayana or bringing the disciple nearer to the spiritual master for the path of tapa. So Brahmaji was thus initiated by Lord Krishna, and this fact is corroborated by Brahmaji himself in his book Brahma Samhita. In Brahma Samhita, Lord Brahma is sung in every verse, Govinda Madhipursam Tamaham Bajam. Thus Brahma was initiated by Krishna mantra, by Lord Krishna himself. And thus he became a Vaishnava, or a devotee of the Lord, before he was able to construct the huge universe. It is stated in Brahma Samhita, Lord Brahma was initiated into the 18-letter Krishna Mantra, 
which is generally accepted by all the devotees of Lord Krishna. Right? Those of you who are second initiated, you'll know the 18 syllable mantra. So that's given to the Krishna devotees. We chant that when we chant Gayatri mantra. So Lord Brahma got initiated by Lord Krishna. It's an opportunity for him to meditate. Gayatri Mantra is a, for meditation, right? It's internal contemplation of the Lord. We chant Japa. We chant Japa we're, that's out externally. It should be loud. We should hear the sound of the Holy Name. But Gayatri, Gayatri is chanted silently in the mind. Not supposed to chant aloud. Gayatri was, they said Gayatri was cursed like that by the other wife of Brahma. That your, your mantra will never be chanted aloud. <laughs> so the Gayatri mantra is for silent meditation. But it, it's a very powerful purification of the mind to contemplate the form of the Lord through chanting the Gayatri mantra. Continuing then, text number seven. When he heard the sound, he tried to find out the speaker, searching on all sides. But when he was unable to find anyone besides himself, he thought it wise to sit down on his lotus seat firmly and give his attention to the execution of penance as he was instructed. So he didn't know where the sound was coming from, so what to do? All right, they told me, to, telling me to do austerity, let me do it. So he sat down on his lotus seat and he began to do austerity. Just sitting, controlling his mind. And of course he was given the Gayatri Mantra, he could chant also the Mantra. He could meditate on that, Krishna Mantra. Text number 8 describes Lord Brahma underwent penance for 1,000 years by the calculation of the demigods. He heard this transcendental vibration from the sky and he accepted it as divine. Thus he controlled his mind and senses and the penances he executed were a great lesson for the living entities. Thus he is known as the greatest of all ascetics. Brahma, the first person in the universe, is doing penance, he's doing tapasya. He's showing the example, the proper use of human life. And by his penance, he was able to give great pleasure to Lord Krishna. So the mood of doing, usually when we think of doing penance, we do it to make up for something wrong. Oh, I did some offence, I did, I did this wrong, I shouldn't have, I should, I'll do some penance, I'll make an atonement. But Lord Brahma is not doing penance like that. He, his purpose in penance is simply that he wants to do this service for Lord Krishna and he wants to get the empowerment to be able to do the creation on behalf of Lord Krishna. And that's why he's doing penance. So the end of uh, the purport there, text number eight, just the second last paragraph, Prabhupada explains, following the order of the bona fide spiritual master is the only duty of the disciple. And this completely faithful execution of the order of the bona fide spiritual master is the secret of success. So we see examples of this in our parampara. We see how Srila Prabhupada faithfully executed the order of his spiritual master. His spiritual master told him, if you ever get money, use it to print books. And his spiritual master had told him, you know, try to preach in the English language. That will be good. You know English, you use it to preach. And so that was an indication to Prabhupada that he should go to the West. But whereas his spiritual master had tried to preach in Europe and in England, Srila Prabhupada decided to go further west to USA. 
because times had changed from the times of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati and it was more the, the world economy was more cent centered in the USA. So Srila Prabhupada chose the USA. And that was following the order of his spiritual master. So of all the orders of the spiritual master, what is the most important? Chant 16 rounds and follow the four regulative principles. Yes, to chant every day at least 16 rounds, right? Try to chant without offence. That is the most crucial of all the instructions of the spiritual master. So we try to, we want to keep that vow. That's a, we make that vow at the time of initiation. Sometimes people ask, why don't we make other vows like go to Mongol Arti or do Kirtan every day. No, but the vow is chant 16 rounds on our beats. That is the standard procedure. Not, no other things. We don't want to speculate on this. The order of the spiritual masters, chant on your beats. You have to do that. So this is the main, the most important of the orders of the spiritual master. Lord Brahma controlled his two grades of senses by means of sense perception and sense organs because he had to engage such senses in the execution of the order of the Lord. Therefore, controlling the senses means engaging them in the transcendental service of the Lord. Right? We have to do something with our senses, not just stop the senses, we have to do some service. What service are you doing? Prabhupada would ask, what are you doing? What service are you doing? So the Lord's order descends in disciplic succession through the bona fide spiritual master. This execution of the order of the spiritual master is factual control of the senses. That is tapasya, following the order of the spiritual master. Continuing, text number 9. Personality of Godhead being very much satisfied with the penance of Lord Brahma, was pleased to manifest his personal abode, Vaikuntha. Now we're going to hear about Vaikuntha, the spiritual planet above all others. This transcendental abode of the Lord, adorned by all self-realized persons, freed from all kinds of miseries and fear of material existence, illusory existence. So who would like to tell me some of the special features of Vaikuntha? Tell me one quality. There is no anxiety. Anxiety? Yeah. No miseries. No miseries, right. No misery, no anxiety, right. It's Vaikuntha. We are in the Kuntha, right. Our planet is Kuntha, Kuntha Loka. All anxiety, all problems, all so many worries. But the spiritual world, Vaikuntha, no anxiety. Okay? So everyone's very happy, right? No anxiety. <laughs> You can also tell me, what do the people look like there in the spiritual world? What kind of bodies do they have? Self-equal body. Sexy body. Satchitananda body, yes, that's yeah, right. Four hands. Four arms, right? Chatur Bhuj, yeah. Youthful. What? They look young, youthful. Yes, right. Are there any old people there? No. No, everybody's the same age. There's no, <laughs> it's true, they're all young. Nobody gets old. Wonderful, huh? <laughs> You don't have to worry about getting old. 
You don't have everyone's young, eternally youthful, in their spirit, in their Satchitananda body, with no anxiety. Yes? Anything else? No disease. No disease. No disease, yes. No COVID, right? <laughs> no vaccination. None of these things. Not fear of death. Yes, no fear of death. Is there any fear there? No. Yes, anything else you can think about? No hatred. Sorry, no what? No hatred. I'm sorry, I'm still not, it's not clear to me what you're saying. No hatred, hatred. Hatred, okay, no hate. Yeah, no hatred of anybody. Everyone's pure-hearted. Pure yeah. They have love, loving dealings, loving exchange with each other. They live in perfect harmony with each other. Why? How do they do that? Because Krishna is in center. Yes. yes, right. Because Krishna is in the center. Because they're all pure mm -hmm. devotees. Pure devotees. So they love, all have. Uh, Pure, pure consciousness. Yes, they have pure, and pure consciousness means what? What does it they mean? They know their, uh, they know their or original uh, identify, uh, identification. They are the part and parcel of Lord Krishna. Right, They're, they know themselves to be part and part. And what is their relationship with Krishna though? Eternal servant. Yeah. Eternal servant, yeah. Right. Yeah, Vaikuntha. Dasharas is predominant. Everyone is in the mood of being the servant. How do we distinguish between the Lord and the devotees? Because in Vaikuntha everyone is four arms. So how do we know who is the Lord? <laughs> uh, yes, right. The Kastuba Jew. And the mark of Sri Vatsa on the chest, the hair, Sri Vatsa hair on the chest. And uh, special signs on his uh, lotus feet. Okay, special markings on the sole, the lotus feet of the Lord. Yes. Are there any ladies there? Or are they all men? Yes, there are. Okay, can you tell me about the ladies? Krishna. Yes, of course, everyone's a servant of Krishna there. Because we see not uh, Chintamani, because Lakshmi, all the they are engaged in the service of Krishna. So how, who, who, who are they? What is their, their identity? The goddesses of fortune? Yes, they're all goddesses of fortune, right? They're all goddesses of fortune. The gopis are also goddesses of fortune, but the gopis are very special <laughs> goddesses of fortune. But in Vaikuntha, we're hearing about Vaikuntha, Lord Brahma, later on Lord Brahma also saw Goloka, but just now he's seeing Vaikuntha. He's seeing Vaikuntha, that supreme planet above all. So he's simply seeing the, 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 what is the Vaikuntha mode. And there, of course, there's men and there's also women. The women are all goddesses of fortune and the men are all pure devotees of the Supreme Lord. Okay, no hatred, no material ignorance, everything's very nice, right? So this is described for several verses. Uh, yeah. Now, Jiva Goswami makes an interesting point. He says that, uh, is there any modes of nature in the spiritual world? 
Vishuddha Sattva, not the three modes, Vishuddha Sattva. Vishuddha Sattva, right. There's no influence of passion or ignorance or even goodness, because goodness, material goodness will be mixed with passion and ignorance. So it's only pure goodness, the Shuddha Sattva. So Jiva Goswami raises the question, he said, but in the material world, variety is produced by the modes of nature. So we may think that because there's no modes of nature in the spiritual world, there cannot be any variety. Do you understand? We may think there cannot be any variety because the, there's no modes of nature. It's the modes of nature which produce a variety. So, how will you deal with that? Any answers? Uh, the spiritual world is full of bliss. So, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the persons who are in the spiritual world, they do not, uh, uh, they are fully satisfied uh, in that mood. They do not want variety. And one answer is also there that uh, the material world is the... Uh, well, you said just now they, they don't want variety. So are you telling me there's no variety there in the spiritual world? Uh, spiritual world also has variety because the material world is the uh, uh, is the reflection uh, reflection yes reflection of the uh, spiritual world material world is a reflection of the spiritual world so that's why uh, there is also variety in spiritual world yes good right the Lord himself is full of variety we see Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna's expansions and incarnation. There's so much variety in the spiritual world. Yes. So, the, but it's it's all due to the spiritual energy. It's not due to the modes of nature. Not due to the material modes of nature. But it's by the interaction of the spiritual energy, the the chit the chit shakti, the spiritual potency of the Lord. Or so that's why there's variety there. Mm. Maharaj, we can also see example of because so many, there are so many Lakshmis uh, are serving the Lord because of variety only. And even there are planes also over there. Yes. This shows, these examples show there is so much variety over there. Okay. Yes. There's certainly proof of variety there. And we see there's also different places in the Vaikuntha, right? You can go to, from Vaikuntha, you may go to, well, we see there are different forms of the Lord, different planets. Somebody goes to the form where Lord Kapila is being worshipped, Devahuti would go there to worship Lord Kapila. And Bhishma, Bhishma Grandfather Bhishma, he went to where the where Lord Krishna is Partha Sarati, driving the chariot of Arjuna. So there's an unlimited number of planets in the spiritual sky, and there are different forms of the Lord in different planets, where the Lord is being worshipped by his different devotees. So we cannot say there's no variety. <laughs> there is so much variety, and it's all due to the spiritual energy. Hmm. Aras, can we also say that there are kalpavriksh trees over there? So if we one wants any variety, then uh, from that also we get. Okay. Yes, kalpavrikshas are there. Different. Although devotees are pure, they, they don't desire anything material from the Kalpa Briksha, but they, they want flowers and fruits. And we see, oh, the Lord. Yes, and we see the Lord's garland, it's different colors, it's not 
just one type of flower, but so many varieties of flowers. And there's so many different trees growing there. And so there is so much variety in the spiritual world. And Dada Rani is cooking different dishes daily. <laughs> yes. Mm. You know, we see it's quite different from Buddhism. In Buddhism, you know, everything is Buddha. There's no variety. Okay. Yes. Um, so, so with, with so much there, and I appreciate that the souls are very, very pure, um, but with, with so much of, of access to all of those things like the desire tree, etc., is there risk that a soul can fall? I'm sorry, the last part of your... Is, is there a risk that the, the devotees can fall down oh, because can... they have access to so much? Can devotees fall down from the Vaikuntha? Yes. Well, the living entity is Tatasta Shakti, so that we could expect that there is a possibility. But Lord Krishna does say, one who enters my abode, he never leaves there. Because one is so happy, so satisfied, never want to leave. That's it. Although you, you may worry, you may become attached, you may enjoy. But the, remember, the devotees who go there are all very pure-hearted. So they see everything in relation to Krishna. The, the trees and the flowers and the fruits and the cows, all of these things, they're all there simply for Krishna's enjoyment. And the devotees use everything for the pleasure of Krishna. So the whole consciousness is, we want to please Krishna. So, so long as they keep that consciousness, you're not going to fall down. But as soon as you become inimical, we think, well, why Krishna? Then immediately we're out. Boom. It's like having a an ejection button in the in the airplane, you know, and you're, you're flying a jet plane and there's, there's an ejection button. You pl press that button and you just shoot out the top of the airplane. And so it's like that. We come out, we fall right out of the spiritual world and take birth in the material world. But it's very, very rare that it happens. Usually nobody, once they come to the spiritual world, they don't fall back. And we see there are many, many more living entities residing in the spiritual world than there are here in this material world. Thank you, Lord. So uh, Prabhupada has a lengthy purport there with very nice examples there. Uh, just to read a little bit from the purport at the end uh, of the purport, Prabhupada said, The whole Vaikuntha existence proclaims that everyone there is a follower of the Lord. The Lord is the chief leader there without any competition for leadership. And the people in general are all followers of the Lord. How nice! You know, we have so many different countries and there's always competition and elections and campaigning, who's going to lead and who's going to be in charge. Even where you have like communist countries, they have, they change the leader, the, they put a leader in and they'll take him out and they'll put somebody else in. So there's always this competition for supremacy. But in the spiritual world, that's not there. The Lord is a leader without any competition. You, they may put someone in and say, oh, he's, he's for life, but he doesn't live for very long. They put him in when he's already um, elderly person. So how long can he live in the leadership role? Then he has to give up, and then somebody else takes over. But in the spiritual world, the Lord has an eternal spiritual body. And everyone's very happy. Everyone's very satisfied. 
There's no question of revolution. Just to finish the purport, Prabhupada said, It is confirmed in the Vedas, therefore, that the Lord is the chief leader, and all other living entities are subordinate to him. For only the Lord satisfies all the needs of all other living entities. So that's a very important point. That one who is the leader, he has to satisfy the needs of the others. That's the problem we find in the material world, that people are always complaining that, oh, this leadership is no good, they're not doing this for us, they're not taking care of us. But in the spiritual world, that problem doesn't come up. Lord Krishna arranges everything so nicely for everyone that everyone is provided for. Every, there's no scarcity, there's no problems, no anxiety. Everything is wonderful. So we get beautiful descriptions of the Vaikuntha planets given there in that section. No. Okay. Going on, hearing a bit more about the inhabitants of the Vaikuntha planets and their complexion, lotus eyes, um, sky bluish complexion, lotus eyes, dress yellow color, very attractive, and four hands, the age of growing youth, all nicely decorated with ornamental medallions, and they appear to be effulgent. Some of them are effulgent like coral and diamonds in complexion, and have garlands on their heads, blooming like lotus flowers, and some wear earrings. Prabhupada says in the purport, there are some inhabitants who have attained the liberation of sarupya, or possessing bodily features like those of the Personality of Godhead. The Vaidurya diamond is especially meant for the Personality of Godhead, but one who achieves the liberation of bodily equality with the Lord is especially favoured with such diamonds on his body. So. You may get the Vaidurya diamond, but you don't get the Kastuba jewel. Kastuba jewel is unique for Lord Krishna. But you may get Vaidurya stones. That's okay. That's for everyone. And then we hear about the airplanes. And the ladies are very beautiful. And they have their companions. And combined together, just like the sky, decorated with clouds and lightning. One Buddhist man, one Buddhist monk I know, an elderly man, he was asking me about the spiritual world. And he asked me, how is it in the spiritual world, in Krishna consciousness? Because he said, in Buddhism, in Buddhism, everyone is Buddha. You know, there's no man and there's no woman. Everyone is simply the Buddha. So how about Krishna consciousness in the spiritual world? So I explained to him that there, is, there are men and women. And they're together. And they may be like husband and wife. But their consciousness is focused on Krishna. Their consciousness is not that, you know, I'm your wife, you have to please me, you have to satisfy me, and, you know, it's not like that. It's not like in the material world, you know, we have to get money, we have to get more, we, my education for my kids, and this and that. All the things, all the problems, all the issues which come in the material world, they're all absent in the spiritual world. But there are men and there are women, and they're together, and they live happily. They don't need to divorce, and they don't fight and quarrel with each other. They live together peacefully. Oh, it must be so nice, huh? Just imagine. 
So Prabhupada says in the purport, although there is nothing but Brahman, one should not mistakenly think that there is only void and no variegatedness. Thinking like that is due to a poor fund of knowledge. Otherwise, no one would have such a misconception of voidness in Brahman. As there are airplanes, ladies and gentlemen, so there must be cities and houses and everything else just suitable to the particular planets. <laughs> so, very wonderful. No imperfections, no environmental issues, no problems like what we have here on this planet. Text 14 describes the goddess of fortune in her transcendental form, engaging in the Lord's loving service. She's not only engaged in variegated pleasure, service to the Lord, along with her constant companions, but is also engaged in singing the glories of the Lord's activities. So when Brahma, text number 15, Brahma saw in the Vaikuntha planets the personality of Godhead, who is the Lord of the entire devotee community, the Lord of the Goddess of Fortune, the Lord of all sacrifices, Lord of the universe, who is served by his foremost servitors like Nanda, Sunanda, Prabhala and Arhana, his immediate associates. So Prabhupada says in the purport, so when we see the Lord, we see him with his different energies, associates, confidential servitors, etc. So the Supreme Lord, who is the leader of all living entities, the Lord of all devotees, the, the Lord of all devotee sects, the Lord of all opulences, the Lord of sacrifices, the enjoyer of everything in this entire creation is not only the Supreme Person, but also is always surrounded by his immediate associates, all engaged in their loving, transcendental service to him. So you'll remember from Nectar of Devotion, one of the qualities which is unique to Lord Krishna, therefore four qualities which are all found in Krishna but are not there even in Lord Vishnu. And one of them is that Lord Krishna is always with his loving devotees. He's always surrounded by his loving devotees. He's not alone. But when he comes, he comes with his assistants and associates. So after hearing about the Goddess of Fortune, then we hear about the Personality of Godhead and His form. He appears to be very much satisfied, His very sight intoxicating and attractive. He had a smiling face decorated with an enchanting reddish hue, dressed in yellow robes, wore earrings and a helmet on His head, had four hands and His chest was marked with the lines of the Goddess of Fortune. So we're getting a very elaborate description about Brahma's vision of Vaikuntha planets. He was able to see all the different people. He was able to see the Goddess of Fortune. Now he's able to actually see the Supreme Lord. In the purport, Prabhupada said, there is a full description of the yoga P, or the particular place where the Lord is in audience to his eternal devotees. Yoga P, just like in Mayapur, we have the yoga P, where Lord Chaitanya made his appearance. So here also, talking about the yoga P, where the Supreme Lord, personality of Godhead, gives uh, his darshan to all of the residents of Vaikuntha. So, so many different personalities are there, personification of the different scriptures, 16 energies are all present, 
and then two gatekeepers and different doors, middle doors and far outside door, <laughs> other doorkeepers, the Lord's palace well decorated and protected by the above mentioned doorkeepers. So not so easy to go in there. We know the four Kumaras got a problem going in there. So you have to be qualified. So we, we hear Lord Brahma sees the Lord seated on his throne, surrounded by his different energies. Like the four, the sixteen, the five, and the six natural opulences, along with other insignificant energies. So, the four, namely, the principles of Prakriti, Purush, Mahatattva and Ego. Then the sixteen, the sixteen meaning the element, five elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, the five sense organs, eye, ear, nose, tongue, tongue and skin, the five working senses, the hands, the legs, the stomach, evacuating organ and genital, and the mind. So sixteen. And then the five includes the five sense objects, meaning form, taste, smell, sound, touch. So all these 25 items serve the Lord in the material creation. And they're all present to serve the Lord. Further on in the purport there, of text 17, just at the end there, the Supreme Lord by his own potency is unlimitedly more powerful than any yogi. He is unlimitedly more learned than any jnani, unlimited richer than any wealthy person, unlimitedly more beautiful than any beautiful living being, and he is unlimitedly more charitable than any philanthropist. He is above all. No one is equal to or greater than him, nor can anyone reach his level of perfection in any of the above powers by any amount of penance or yoga demonstrations. The yogis are dependent on his mercy. Out of his immensely charitable disposition, he can award some temporary powers to the yogis because of the yogis hankering for them. But to his unalloyed devotees who do not want anything from the Lord, save and accept his transcendental service, the Lord is so pleased that he gives himself in exchange for unalloyed service. So this is the unique relationship between the devotee and the Supreme Lord. Everyone else, they want, they have some material desires, right? They say, Bhukti Mukti Siddhikami Sakale Ashanta Krishna Bhakti Niskam Sa Esha Shanta. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita it says, you may have all material desires, you may want liberation, you may want yoga perfection, and so many different things you want, but they're not peaceful. But the devotee does not have any desire. He is actually peaceful. He, ha he actually achieves peace because he has no desire for anything material. And that is so pleasing to Krishna, that Krishna gives his own self. So Lord Brahma saw the Supreme Lord and he bowed down before the Lord. That is the way of the highest perfection for the living being, the Paramahamsa. Right? Lord Brahma is so, is so purified, so when he actually sees the Lord, the, his love appear, awakens and tears from his eyes and choking of the voice, and he bows down, he, he, he 
he cannot even think to look directly on the Lord. But he, he looks down at the feet of the Lord and then comes up. So in this verse, Lord Brahma had spoken of, I was described by Sukadeva Goswami, that this is the way of the Paramahansas, the highest perfection, the path of the Paramahansas. And we spoke about this yesterday also, maybe you remember. Lord Chaitanya was asking Ramananda Rai to give a verse from the scriptures about the goal of life give a verse from the scriptures about the ultimate goal of life. Then Ramananda Rai began, he, sp he spoke, he gave a verse about Varnashram. And Lord Chaitanya said, oh, that's external, go something else. And then he gave a verse from Bhagavad Gita about Karmarpana, offering the fruits to Krishna. Lord Chaitanya said, go higher, give some more. And so then he gave another verse about giving up our duties for Dharma Tyag. Sarva Dharma Pariksha, right? Surrendering to Krishna. Lord Chaitanya said, keep going, go further. Then he gave another verse from Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma. That, that is, uh, that is mukti, uh, that is devotion mixed with the da desire for liberation. It is not pure devotion. So Lord Chaitanya still said, you have to keep going. And then Ramananda Rai gave this nice verse, which is quoted in the purport here, in text 18, from the 10th canto, spoken by Lord Brahma. Jani prayasam udapashya namanta eva, jivanti sanmukaritam bhavadiya bhartam, staneistita shutigatan tanvan manobir, ye prayaso jita jitopi asitai strilokyam. Right? What Brahma was saying, just stay in your position, your posi your, whatever position you're in, stay in that position and hear about Krishna. If you hear about Krishna in the association of the devotees, this is the path of the Paramahansas. And this is the path which Lord Brahma followed also. Lord Brahma also follows this path. He takes pleasure in hearing the topics of Lord Krishna. So we should hear from the devotees. And the result of this hearing is that one day we will conquer Krishna. Although Krishna is Ajita, we can conquer him. Mm. So going ahead to text number 19, we hear about Lord Brahma that he is present before Lord Krishna and uh, we hear Lord Krishna, sh oh, well Lord, we're told the Lord, is it Krishna? It may be Lord Vishnu, but anyway, the Lord shook hands with Brahma and slightly smiling addressed him. So shaking hands with Lord Brahma, it's like Brahma is almost like on the level of Lord Krishna. It's almost on the level of God. So Jiva Goswami asked, he said, is this actually possible? Lord Brahma is just an insignificant demigod. We know there's a Brahma in every universe. And our Brahma only has four heads. He's a small Brahma. There are so many more important Brahmas with many, many heads. And so this Brahma is really insignificant. Will Krishna really shake hands with him? Isn't that, you know, isn't that becoming over familiar? You know, just like, just like you're not supposed to, uh, you know, if the king comes or something, you know, you don't just walk up and embrace him, you know. Oh, my dear king, <laughs> you know, we show respect. We have to show respect to great personalities. We keep a distance from them and we, 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 we bow to them. So here's Lord Brahma and the Lord is shaking hands with him. So is it proper? What do you think?
Brahma is a great devotee of the Lord. Well, there are many great devotees of the Lord. Does it mean they can all go and shake hands with the Lord? Krishna's mercy. Krishna's mercy. Mm -hmm. uh, Ramaji is a devotee in Pakhara. Well, that's what Prabhupada says because he shook hands with the Lord, because the Lord shook hands with him. So that seems to indicate that he must be in Sakiras. But before that, we don't know. Anyway, uh, Jiva Goswami answers by saying that we have to understand how much Lord Krishna loves his devotees that Lord Krishna has a very, very intimate relationship with all of his devotees. His very, those devotees who have sacrificed everything for him, for his service. So Lord Krishna is just like Lord Krishna. What did Lord Krishna say about the gopis? He said, Naparayaham, I cannot repay you that you have done so much, you have given so much for me. I can never repay you. So Lord Krishna, in the same way, he, he feels very much obliged to Lord Brahma because Lord Brahma has taken so much trouble for... How long did he do penance for? How long was he doing tapasya for? 1,000 celestial years. Yes, 1,000 years of the demigods. He was performing austerity. A long time. And he was alone in the universe at that time. And he did 1,000 years. The Lord was very pleased with him. The Lord had actually given him that instruction. He was the one to speak. So Lord Krishna has a very deep relationship with the devotees. Anyone who makes offerings to the Lord, the Lord will accept it the devotees, the pure devotees. Uh, at the end of the purport of this text, number 19, just at the end, very last paragraph, anyone, however, preaching the mission of the Lord in the line of the Brahma Sampradaya is always dear to the Lord. And the Lord, being satisfied with such a preacher, of the authorized Bhakti cult shakes hands with him in great satisfaction. So it's not just causeless mercy. The Lord is actually satisfied with such a preacher. We, you know, we, we sometimes we would like to think that somehow we can satisfy the Lord by our service. It's not a very easy thing to do. You want to satisfy the Lord. But we should be meditating like that. What do I need to do to satisfy the Lord? Going ahead, text 20. Lord Krishna, uh, the Personality of Godhead addresses Brahma. I'm very pleased with you for your long accumulated penance with a desire for creation. Hardly am I pleased with the pseudo mistakes. I wish you good luck, O Brahma. You may ask from me, the giver of all benediction, all that you may desire. And you may know the ultimate benediction is to see me by realization. Then text 22, the highest perfectional ingenuity is the personal perception of my abodes. And this has been possible because of your submissive attitude in the performance of severe penance, according to my order. So, Lord Krishna is glorifying and person who can, who is qualified to actually see the spiritual world. The highest perfectional stage of life is to know the Lord by actual perception. 
to actually be able to see the Lord by the grace of the Lord. This can be attained by everyone who is willing to discharge the act of devotional service. And, of course, there's many different ways we can perform that devotional service. But we want to meditate and we want to think how I can do something to just satisfy my spiritual master. And if we satisfy the spiritual master, certainly satisfying to Krishna. Going ahead, text 23, O sinless Brahma, you may know from me that it was I who ordered you to undergo penance when you were perplexed in your duty. Such penance is my heart and soul, and therefore penance and I are non-different. We want to meditate also on the importance of performing that kind of austerity, penance, doing accepting what may appear to be difficult for us. You know, of course, some people do Chaturmashya or Bhishma Panchak, these kind of penances. But there's other ways to do penance, service to Krishna. Simply being steady in our service and maintaining our service in difficult conditions over a long period of time, that is also very pleasing. Lord Chaitanya never liked to see devotees give up their service and go away. He liked to see them maintain their service. Now Lord Chaitanya was very strict with Gadarhar. When Gadarhar Pandit wanted to follow him, he didn't want, he said, no, you have to worship Tota Gopinath, you stay here. Lord Chaitanya didn't like people to give up their service. And similarly, Prabhupada also, he liked to see people stay in their service. So such penance is the internal potency of the Lord and is non-different from Him. So the it's the internal potency. That means it's spiritual, it's not material. And Prabhupada explains further, such acts of internal potency are exhibited by non-attachment for material enjoyment. So we know when we're actually renouncing, how much we're able to give up material enjoyment. It's important for us. We want to keep ourselves always engaged in the service of Krishna. At the end of the purport of text 23, Prabhupada writes, Therefore, only love and penance combined can please the Lord, and thus one is able to attain His complete mercy. He directs the sinless, and the sinless devotee attains the highest perfection of life. So certainly we have to be without sin. We have to avoid all sinful activities. That is primary in performing devotional service, to give up all sinful activity. Lord Brahma was sinless and therefore he could follow the orders of Lord Krishna and he could do that tapasya. Text 24, Lord Krishna describes, I create this cosmos by such penance. I maintain it by the same energy and I withdraw it all by the same energy. Therefore, the potency is penance only. We can understand uh, penance is really being the message here, the important point to grasp here. And Prabhupada's purport is very important also. He talks about uh, in executing penance, one must be determined to return home back to Godhead and must decide to undergo all types of tribulations for that end. Even for material prosperity and name and fame, 
one has to undergo severe type of penance. Otherwise, no one can become an important person in the material world. Why then should there not be severe types of penance for the perfection of devotional service? And then Prabhupada states, an easygoing life, an attainment of perfection in transcendental realization cannot go together. An easygoing life, not good for Krishna consciousness. The Lord is more clever than any living entity. Therefore, he wants to see how painstaking the devotee is in devotional service. So Prabhupada is encouraging all of us not to run away from difficulties, but to recognize them. The difficulties are sent to us by the grace of Krishna. Some Krishna will test us. And so these tests will come in the form of these difficulties. How much pain, how much trouble are you willing to take to get some, to achieve some goal, to get somewhere for the service of Krishna? And then at the end of the, the same purport, 24, uh, to execute the order of the spiritual master, however painstaking is the severe type of penance. One who follows this principle rigidly is sure to achieve success in attaining the Lord's mercy. So we remember in the beginning of our Krishna consciousness movement, how devotees did undergo a lot of austerity to do things for the pleasure of Prabhupada, to establish the Krishna consciousness movement, to distribute books everywhere. There's so many things. They accepted so much austerity. And it was very pleasing to Prabhupada. So then Lord Brahma replies to the, to the Supreme Lord, it tells them, you are in everyone's heart, you are aware of the endeavor by your supreme intelligence, without any hindrance. So, we see now, what we see now, we're going to see the, the four questions which are answered by the Chatur Sloki of the Bhagavatam. And text number 26 is the first question which is going to be put. It's the first question to be put of the Chatur Sloki and will be replied in the first, in, in uh, text 33, the Aham Eva Sam Eva, Eva Gre, the first verse of the Chatur Sloki. So the question which is coming from Lord Brahma is that I am praying to you to kindly fulfill my desire. May I please be informed how, in spite of your transcendental form, you assume the mundane form, although you have no such form at all. So this is the first question, which is the basis of the first verse of the Chatur Sloki. All right, text number 26, and then text 27 is the second question, and it's the basis of the second verse of the Chatur Sloki. Translation reads, And please inform me how you, by your own self, manifest different energies for annihilation generation, acceptance, and maintenance by combination and permutation. So these first two questions, you can see they're related to sambandha gyan. Sambandha gyan meaning knowledge of the Lord and the Lord's energies. We will hear in the Chatur Shloki how the Lord explains 
himself and his different energies. Prabhupada at the end of the purport of 27 writes, in other words, there is nothing but the Lord, and still the Lord is different from all such manifest from all such manifestive activities. How is it? How is it so will be explained later on. So then text 28, there's no question there, but uh, Lord Brahma is describing about the Lord's energies. That tell me philosophically all about them. You play like a spider that covers itself by its own energy and your determination is infallible. And Prabhupada describes in the purport the same thing. The exact example is the spider and the spider's web. It's a perfect analogy relating how the Lord creates the material world and how he creates it and then dissolves it again. So just like the spider, the web is created by the spider, it is maintained by the spider, and as soon as the spider likes, the whole thing is wound up within the spider. Spider is covered within the web. If an insignificant spider is so powerful as to act according to its will, why can't the Supreme Being act by His Supreme Will in creation, maintenance and destruction of the cosmic manifestation? By the grace of the Lord, a devotee like Brahma or one in the chain of disciplic succession can understand the almighty personality of Godhead, eternally engaged in his transcendental pastimes in the region of different energies. Then text 20, 29, which is the third question of the four questions which will be answered in the Chatur Sloki. This is the third question, text number 29. Please tell me so that I may be taught in the matter by the instruction of the personality of Godhead, and may, and thus, and may thus act instrumentally to generate living entities without being conditioned by material activities. So that's the third question. And then text 30, we get the, the fourth question. Oh my Lord, the unborn, you've shaken hands with me just as a friend does with a friend, as if equal in position. I shall be engaged in the creation of different types of living entities, and I shall be occupied in your service. I shall have no perturbation, but I pray that all this may not give rise to pride, as if I were the Supreme. Text 31. The Lord is replying, and text 31, very important purport. The first paragraph of the purport, Srila Prabhupada summarizes the four questions of Brahma in that very first paragraph of the purport, of text number 31. He's summarizing the four questions of Brahma and uh, the chatters, how the chatters, what the chatters sloki is going to be teaching. So you can go through that purport and you can see how Prabhupada has given a nice synopsis there of the four verses. And then also in this purport, Srila Prabhupada has covered the four main points of the Chatur Shloki. The first point being knowledge, Gyan. Knowledge, like the form of the Lord. What is the form of the Lord? 
how to understand it. And then also vigyan. There is gyan, which is not vigyan means realization. How do we actually understand this knowledge? We may know the knowledge, we know something, but how do we realize it? And so the realization, the application of that knowledge. So these two things, gyan and vigyan, this is the sambandha gyan, this is a portion of sambandha gyan, dealing with the first two uh, questions of the chatra sloki dealing with the, the Lord and His energies. So this is explained there in the purport. I'll just read a little bit here. In the, uh, this is uh, halfway through the first... Well, it's, it's all one big... <laughs> the purport is all one paragraph. Huh? Anyway, he says, Prabhupada's written, the mental speculators can reach up to the standard of impersonal Brahman realization. But factually, complete knowledge of transcendence is beyond the knowledge of impersonal Brahman. This, thus, it is called the supreme confidential wisdom. So, wisdom, knowledge. And what is that knowledge? That is the form of the Lord which is beyond the knowledge of the impersonal Brahman, knowledge of the transcendental form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then another point which is brought up is prayojana, prayojana, the goal of the process, the goal of the Sambandha Gyan is the prayojana. And the goal is to develop love of God. So this is Rahasya. Prabhupada writes in the purport here in text 31, this mystery, this mystery is love of Godhead. We'll hear about that next week when we talk about text number 35. And then text 36 describes Abhidaya, the process itself, how to execute the process, which is uh, dealing with the different paraphernalia which are required to execute sadhana bhakti. And Prabhupada talks about that also in the purport. He says, the main, the main qualification for knowing the mystery of the Personality of Godhead Therein lies the main qualification for knowing the mystery of the Personality of Godhead. And to attain the stage of transcendental love of God, to attain the stage, that's the, uh, the prayojana, the stage of love of God is prayojana, but to come to that stage we need the abhidaya, and that is the regulative principles of devotional service must be followed. The regulative principles are called Vaidhi Bhakti or devotional service of the Lord and they can be practiced by a neophyte with his present senses. Such regulative principles are mainly based on hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. All right, so this is the Abhidaya. This Important purport there, text number 31. We get a lot of information there. Text 32 is a prelude to the speaking of the Chatur Sloki. So we'll begin there next week. When we meet again next week, we'll begin from text number 32. And then 33 is the first verse of the Chatur Sloki. We have to go through the Chatur Sloki. So we have a week. You have a week to prepare. You can look over these purports. If you have any problems, then you can meet with me. We can talk. Are there any questions today? Anyone?
No questions? Okay. So thank you very much. So we'll see you next weekend. Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Go Premanandi. Hare Bhagavatam.